Hello, and welcome to How to Read an Imitest Plot. This is actually the first in what will hopefully be an ongoing series of short videos where with each installment we um, delve into a single figure or plot produced by Imitest and try to um, impart some knowledge on how to read these things quickly and get the information you need out of them at a glance. My name is Rob. I'm an imaging science engineer here at Imitest. And uh, today we're going to be looking at this image, which I took of an ESFR ISO chart. Um, now, it's not a great image, I admit. It's not a terrible image. Uh, it looks a little bit overexposed, perhaps, and a little warm on the white balance. So we're actually going to look at those properties of it today. I'm going to load this into res charts here. I'm already set up for ESFR ISO to analyze one of these charts. So I'm going to select the image. Now, um, rest charts can read lots of different charts. You have to set it up, tell it what to expect to look for. And when you do, you can see that it actually automatically finds our regions of interest pretty well. Now, um, we're going to be looking at display number five today, which is tonal response and white balance in gamma. So as you can see, there are a lot of things you can measure from an ESFR ISO chart. This is going to be uh, what we look at today. Now, as the name of this display implies, there's two things <laughs> being displayed here at once. They actually share the same common x-axis. We're going to deal with um, this uh, lower plot later, this is the white balance error, and right now we're going to talk about the tonal response curves on top. So these curves make use of the gray patch uh, information in the center of the chart here. So each of these is a measurement from one of these patches, and uh, very roughly it goes from darkest patch on the left to brightest patch on the right. Now, the actual x-axis values are in log exposure, uh, which has to do with the relative amount of light coming from the scene. And this is equivalent to um, negative target density. So, so density is actually kind of a holdover term from the days of film photography, where it would have light transmitted through film. And denser film would transmit less light through it. And so, um, high density is actually a term for dark areas in your scene. And low density, which lets the most light through, is uh, related to the light areas of the scene. So this is actually the lowest density patch, and this is the highest density patch. And so what that actually means is, is that's related to the most light comes from the scene from reflected off this patch, and the least light comes from the scene reflected off this patch. So um, these points on each of these curves comes fr uh, they all come from measurements from this darkest patch here and all these points on the farthest right side of this curve come from this brightest patch. So this top plot here actually shows pixel response to these different amounts of light. So this is the essentially measured pixel values um, and we can see how as you increase the light, how a pixel will increase its actual output. So um, these are in terms of nor log of normalized pixel response. So up top is the, uh, it says zero, but this is actually the maxim maximum amount of pixel response that um, you can get in an image. So we can see here that since this is bit, an 8-bit image, this is actually, um, related to 255. So, so these values are log of um, pixel response relative to the maximum of 255. So zero means you're at 255. You, you know, there, uh, there's been no, um, no attenuation from the maximum. And then as we get down here, we get that this is um, negative one of log 10 of the maximum. So, so what does that mean? Well, let's do a quick uh, sanity check if we actually use our data cursor tool here and look at um, the green channel. So, so there's four curves here. 
each of these are actually the measured red, green, and blue values in each of these patches. But um, the fourth curve is actually the luminance, which is related to um, basically a grayscale representation of the human perception of the amount of uh, how light each of these regions is. But um, to kind of get a sense for what these units mean uh, as a sanity check, let's look at in this darkest patch here, we see that it's about uh, about negative one of these log normalized units. And uh, so that means that it should be one tenth. This is a log 10. So this is um, one tenth of 255. So we would expect to see green pixel values in this darkest patch of about 25. So if you look at that middle value here, G, we actually do see that that seems to be about the mean in this area. Uh, so that actually kind of checks out. So um, one tenth of the response is negative one of these log normalized units. So the first obvious thing here is that uh, as light goes up, the pixel value goes up as well. Uh, that should make a lot of intuitive sense. If we saw a decreasing trend here, well, that basically means your camera is responding less to more light, which is kind of, uh, maybe you have a very special camera, but that sounds like a broken camera to me. So, uh, you know, if you ever load up this plot and you see something that isn't essentially monotonically increasing, you know something funky is going on. Maybe you have some localized tone mapping, which is doing something very strange, but for most um, camera responses, which have a global tone curve, you should see some sort of monotonically increasing shape here. Now, one thing you can see here is that um, this is actually a relatively straight trend here until we get into the upper regions of this curve where it kind of um, flattens out. This sort of shoulder is pretty common in cameras to uh, keep the highlights in an image from being saturated. Um, if this were actually a, a raw image and we were looking at sensor data and that was supposed to be actually linear, we would actually see not only um, predictably a straight line of this curve, but also its slope would be one. So the slope is actually related to the gamma of the system. Um, so the slope changes here, but for a system that actually had a pure, simple um, power relationship between the amount of light received at the sensor and the pixel response, we would see a straight line and the slope of that line would be the gamma of the system. So here we report a gamma, which is actually um, the average slope of this system since it's varying. One other piece of information here is the uh, exposure error. Uh, and as I said, uh, you know, the image was a little bit overexposed and this is a quantitative measurement of actually how much this image was overexposed. So this plot is related to a dynamic range plot, but to actually tell the dynamic range of a system, we have to know about the noise in the system that actually kind of determines the lower end of the performance. Um, and so we don't show noise here. That'll be for a future uh, installment of the series, but it is useful to um, think starting now about these units because these are going to be common units for these sort of tonal response and uh, dynamic range plots. So this is a, a first exposure into these units to start thinking about. Now, uh, perhaps a helpful little thought experiment would be, uh, what if I had overexposed this image even more so? So uh, what would happen if all of these patches were brighter? Well, uh, the x-axis units, because they are tied to the actual relative reflective properties of these patches, would actually end up being the same, but our data would increase. So uh, we would expect to see perhaps this entire curve lifts up, essentially, this entire family of curves, rather. Uh, let's explore that. So I actually 
not surprisingly, I have a the same image, <laughs> a little bit more overexposed. Um, let me set up to do a run for both of these. A fixed run. Since it's hard to see two things interactively at once, we will um, produce these plots with a fixed run. Getting a lot more information than we need just for a tonal response. Okay, let's see. So, oh, I am backwards. So, um, what we see here is that same figure produced uh, and saved for these two different images. This is for the one we were just, this is the same uh, set of plots that we were just looking at and uh, for the first image, and this is the same plot for uh, the second brighter image. So what we can see is that our hypothesis has come true. Um, so the x-axis values have stayed the same because the same relative amount of light is coming from each of those patches in the scene, but um, actually more uh, light was, since I, I had increased the exposure time on this image, more total light was received, more photons were received, um, but the, the same relative amounts of light was received at each of these locations. So the x-axis values remain the same because they're defined by the chart, but the actual pixel response values here have increased. So the entire family of curves has moved up because the pixel values are actually higher in this overexposed image, which makes sense. And we actually see um, a fair amount of saturation in some of these uh, brightest patches, not necessarily in all the color channels, but um, some of the color channels, especially like the red channel is saturating um, before the others in each of these, some of these lighter patches, whereas before maybe only in the actual, the absolute brightest patch was this happening. So that's a very quick primer on how these response values of the pixels are related to the exposure and uh, the relative reflectances or the densities of these grayscale patches in the image. So the part of this figure which we have neglected so far is this lower plot here. So this tells us the error in our white balance in terms of uh, degrees Kelvin of the light source illuminating this chart. So um, light sources are often described by the correlated color temperature um, related to a black body heated to a certain temperature in Kelvin, and this tells you um, the the error in the uh, in terms of Kelvin of the light source, which appears to have been used to illuminate these patches. So we see here that all of our temperature differences are negative. This actually can be interpreted as saying that the values measured in the image appear to have come from a light source, uh, appear to have been illuminated by a light source, which was burning at, at fewer Kelvin than the white balance of the camera expected. Interestingly, uh, with this overexposed image, we can actually see this trend where the error gets smaller and smaller so a, a correctly white balanced image, all of these channels would have the same level of response in, um, at each of these patches because a correctly white balanced image is one where um, all of the RGB um, have the same response and that gets interpreted as neutral tone, uh, a neutral color, sorry. Um, and we actually see it appears that this is happening in the brightest patches here, but only because all of the data channels have saturated. So um, when they've all saturated, they will all be equal and we would have zero uh, color temperature difference. But that actually is an artifact of saturation. That's not actually meaningful data. But that does kind of jive with this upward trend here of um, the fact of these compression of the relative differences, uh, distances between these color channels here.
So that's it for now. I, I realize that there's a lot more that we could go into for even just a single plot, but we're trying to keep these videos pretty short and manageable. Hopefully this video has given you some tools and some background to be able to uh, conduct your own thought experiments about what you'd expect to see these plots do if you varied certain imaging parameters or if you had different types of systems that responded in different ways. If you have any questions or comments uh, that follow up on this or suggestions for future videos on what to cover, please let us know and uh, we'll, we'll see you at the next installment. Thank you very much.